If you're in Montgomeryville, hope you had a good beginning to your year. If you, if you don't notice, like I'm a hype guy, so I like, like, I like energy and like let's clap, let's go, I'll clap, you clap, I'll high five, you high five, let's go, right? Um, but I wanted this year to be different. I wanted to start 2024 off more contemplative, uh, a little deeper. Can we do that? A um, little bit more direction. So I went on, on Amazon and I got this, uh, this time capsule. I thought it was going to be bigger. And so <laughs> what's interesting, though, is uh, so the only time I've ever had one of these is for Parcheesi or something like that, right? And so um, and I didn't have any board games because it's 2024, and so, but I, uh, so we don't play them or we haven't played them for a long time or we lose all the pieces. And so, so I went on Amazon and I got one and I didn't look at the dimensions of it. Um, I just, w- I wanted to get one that represented my sermon, and so it's 45 minutes, that's the closest I could get to that, it was two hours, and so I didn't figure you want to be here for two hours today, so I got this 45 minute time capsule, and it's so small, <laughs> and it seems so insignificant, and I think that's actually um, how God wanted it to play out. Because so many times, our time on this earth, um, it seems super insignificant. It, it, we don't even think about it. Like it just, it's just like we're living. Right? This represents 45 minutes. I'm just going to stick it on the ground. When it's done, I'll be done, maybe. And so, <laughs> I actually don't know if it's 45 minutes. I never timed it. And so... Um, a little bit of uh, insight how we got here. And so I'm, a, you know, New Year started, and I told you, I said, right before the end of last year, I had not a near-death experience, but for preaching purposes, for dramatic purposes, let's call it a near-death experience. And uh, I was driving on the road to work, and uh, as I was driving, a bigger truck swerved over into my lane, just for a few seconds, was driving straight at me. And uh, I do that all the time, to be honest with you. I just, I'm on my phone a lot, and so I just swerve over, come back, and so... Um, I'm going to not do that. I'm just making a confession. Uh, and so, but I, it swerved and then it went right back over. And I just had this thought. Like if that guy wouldn't have moved, a girl, whoever it was driving that truck, I would have probably died. Like if I wasn't looking up and they weren't looking up and we collided, that would be the end of my life. And I asked, I had this question, are you ready to die? If that was it, 43 years is what you got, that, that's it. Are you ready to die? I want to ask you the same question. Are you ready to die? I know it sounds morbid. Um, I know it's probably something you shouldn't think about or want to think about. I know you probably want to think about your New Year's resolution, right? I um, know you want to think about losing weight or lifting weights or going to the gym or eating better or becoming a vegan or whatever we do in the new year, right? And so whatever things we do, you know, I want to spend more time with my family. Like there's a New Year's resolutions. I, I get all that, right? But, but what if, what if we, we got deeper than that? What if like I, I told you, like there's a good shot in this church over the next 12 months, somebody sitting in this room right now is not going to be alive. That's just reality. Somebody's going to die unexpectedly. Somebody's going to get a disease unexpectedly. Something is going to happen. That's just statistically you know, probably going to happen. Could be me, could be you. Are we living in a way where we're ready t- to die? Are we, are we, and some of you are like, is that, is that something you should do? The Bible talks over and over and over again about it. And so if you don't understand the Bible or maybe you've never read it and you look at it maybe like a normal book, like it's one, one, one book, you know, one writer written kind of over maybe a couple months or whatever, like the Bible's not like that. The Bible is a, a book written over 1,600 years. Um, it's written by uh, 40 different authors, right? They're, they're, it's made up of books, 66 books. It was written in three different languages on three different continents. That's, a, that's the time that it spanned. The, and if you read the Bible, one of the themes all through the Bible is pay attention to time. Pay attention to your life. Don't, don't just let it pass you by. Over and over and over again. Psalms 90 says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Psalms 39 says, show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting that my life is. 
You have made my days a mere handbreadth. The span of my years is as nothing before you. I love this part. Everyone is but a breath, even those who seem secure. So here's the thing. Young people, don't tune me out. You know, older people, you're like leaned in, right? right? <laughs> We're closer to it. And I get, I'm four, I'm be 44, and so I'm, right, as they call it, over the hill. And so, but I remember when I was younger, and I, and I would hear messages like this. I would hear about time, and, and honestly, the last time I preached on a message like this, it was five years ago, 2019, the world was a little bit different. And uh, a half of decade has passed since I talked, I wasn't even 40 years old at that point. And the problem is so many times we'll preach on something like this or think about this or go to a funeral and it'll be kind of a quick burst of reality and life and death and okay, we should probably think about it. And then you go and you have like a moment where you're like, I should probably spend some time thinking about it. And then we just move quickly past it. We forget. I live in an older house and so uh, I feel like my house has a lot of holes in it. And so because my house has a lot of holes in it, mice get in my house more frequently. Anybody have a house like that? And uh, so m- mice get in my house a lot, so I have to set traps a lot. And uh, this year I've had a lot of mice. I've caught probably seven, eight, nine mice. And some of you are like, do you, do you, do you keep them alive? And I kill them, right? And so they're, they're demonic. Snakes eat mice, and snake is Satan in the Bible, and so that's Satan's food. And so, so I kill them, right? I don't, don't like, do you keep them alive? No, I don't. And so, so I have these traps. I actually got reusable traps, right? And so I care about the environment. And so... And so I catch these, these they're, they're plastic, you put a little peanut butter in there, and I, and I catch them, and then I take them out, and I just dispose of them in my, in my yard, and uh, let nature have its way with them. And so, but every time I catch a, a mouse, I lose my appetite for like a day. Anybody else? Like I, I, I can't, I, all of a sudden I can't eat, you know, little, little pieces of chocolate, it just, I just lose my, my appetite, if you know what I'm talking about. Uh, Swiss cheese starts to gross me out, and so... And I really like Swiss cheese. It's like a rite of passage for a middle-aged man. And so, um, and I'll lose my appetite. And I, and I literally, I won't be hungry for, for a few days. And, and then something happens, it comes back. <laughs> right? I'll be gnawing on Hershey, Hershey's and, and, and I'll eat Swiss cheese. And I go back and then I catch another mouse. Maybe we, we you know, a couple days later or a month later if, if, if the Lord keeps me safe from them from that long. And then, and then I get, and I lose my, and so, this is what happens in life. You hear a sermon, okay, you know, okay, I'm going to take it serious. And then it just kind of passes. And before you, you know it, you've lost, you've lost time, and it's just, just passing. And so what, what I want to do is I want to I I do a whole month on the importance of embracing a spiritual understanding of, of time, of living a life where you are, you are thinking about what happens after life, of living a life where you're taking advantage. So we're, we're going we're to take a look at some different topics as we go forward. Like next week, I want to talk to you uh, about not sweating the small stuff. Some of you are allowing your entire life, your time on this earth, to be impacted by something that's not that big of a deal. You, you, it's just true. Like I know nobody ever tells you that. But some of you are allowing everything in your life to be impacted by something that shouldn't be impacting you still. You're, you're sweating the small stuff. Uh, then I want to talk to you the week after that about letting go of grudges. You're holding on to something that you should have let go a long time ago. Then we're going to talk about focusing on what truly matters. Here's a question you should ask yourself. Is what I'm focusing on going to matter in 50 years? Is it going to matter? Focusing on what, what matters, and in the last week we're going to talk about taking that chance or going for whatever God is calling you to go for, stepping out in faith. Too many people live with regret in their life. They think to themselves, I wish I would have tried that. I wish I would have said yes. I wish I would have taken that chance. But today I just want to talk to you on the concept and the reality, the spiritual understanding of time. We call this message Ticking Time Bomb, not to be dramatic. But I want you to understand time as a spiritual concept, right? Time is a spiritual concept. Here's what William Penn said. He said, time is what we want most, but what we use the worst. Time is what we want most, right? The answer to your time problem is not more time. How many of you would say, hey, if I could just have more time, I'd be better? The answer is not more time. The answer is a better spiritual understanding of the time you've been given. 
So let me just give you a few thoughts. Well, I call these time truths. Number one is this. This one might, might shock you. This one's important, though. Time is pricelessly precious. Time, what you have right now on this side of eternity, is, price, is priceless and it's precious. It's pricelessly precious. Let me, let me, let me just come, come, come. Let's, let's leave here and let's go to our houses real fast. Okay? Everybody go to your house. Everybody, wherever you live, apartment, house, car, wherever. It just we go to it, right? And so you just go. Okay, everybody there in your house? Okay, how many of you in your house have something that you really love? Anybody? Okay, let's just be, let's, let's, some of you super spiritual, like I have, some of you super spiritual in this, you're like, I have my Bible, right? You're like, I have my Bible. Okay, that's great for you. And so, uh, your Bible. My big leather bound Bible, right? And so, okay. They're like, why aren't you saying that, Pastor? My Bible is over there on my seat. It's on my phone. It's on my app. And so, uh, it's with me. And so, that doesn't apply to me today. And so, some of you, let's just be honest, your most prized possession at your house is your TV. Am I preaching Right? Like, you've worked your entire life, you got that flat screen TV at the perfect angle, it's there, right? It's, you spend a lot of time with your TV. Don't, don't, some of you, some of you, it's a, it's a family heirloom, something you have in a safe. Some of you, it's, 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 it's a picture, you have a memory of something, it's, it's a picture, it's framed. Uh, somebody told me um, that their, their spouse was their most prized possession, I was like, oh, come on, man, you're a liar, right? You're lying, right? super spiritual and your spouse is here with you so play the game right and so you know how people get let's just be honest what what is, okay you got you have your most prized possession everybody have it okay everybody has it if I came into your house today I was like yeah I'm coming over to your house today and I walked in you gave me access I walked in and I just took that prized possession and I just left with it and didn't even ask you I'm like I feel like the Lord told me to give this to you I ripped your TV off your wall I put it under my arm I walk out I put it in my house right I go get into your garage some of you have a car right that car is your most prized it didn't even it, look it, it snowed a little bit that car's in there for three months right you're like it's not and so my car some of you it's a, it's a tractor whatever it is I get in on the drive, drive it out right okay and I just left without asking. I just took it, right? That's your most prized possession. It's precious to you. And I just took it. What would be your reaction? <coughs> oh, take it, Pastor. You're right. But no, you'd be mad. You'd be like, you, you, you just, you stole this from me. You didn't ask. You just stole it, right? Maybe, maybe I sneak in. You're not paying attention. I just sneak into your house. You're not there yet. You're at church. Pastor's preaching long-winded, right? You just, I just sneak in. And I just take it from you and walk away. Our reaction would be we're angry, right? So let me, I guess that's what I want to do to start. Maybe me, maybe you. We look at our time. We look at our life. We look at how we pass it, all that stuff. What I want to do is I want you to get a little bit irritated, a little bit angry, a little bit concerned, and go, man, um, if time is precious and priceless, if it's something that I have that I can't get more of, that I can't buy more of, I always read articles about people that are going backwards in their age. I'm like, what the heck is that, right? And so look in the mirror. It's not working for you. And so, right, like, no, no, you don't get more time. It, you, you, you get the time that God has allotted to you. You don't get more time, even though you want to buy it, right? So time becomes your most precious, priceless commodity. Okay, I want you to get angry because here's the problem. So many of us, without even know, knowing it, are allowing Satan, our spiritual enemy, to walk into our house and steal it from us. We don't even see it, right? We don't even see it. Five years ago, I preached the exact same sermon. What, what do I say? Exact same sermon. Time is precious. Time is priceless. Okay, Satan's coming in and stealing. How do we, like, we're like well, how does that look? Okay, when you say to the American person, hey, how's life going? What is their number one thing most of the time they say? It's what? It's super busy. It's super busy. It's almost like it's normal. Right? Satan doesn't have to make us bad. He just makes us busy. Five years ago, same sermon, same thing. Five years passed. Hey, five years ago, what do you think if I asked somebody, hey, how's life going? How was your holidays? How's it going? You got kids? How's that going? It is super. Five years passed, it's still super. Ten years from now, it's going to be super what? Like it's like God said, let there be busyness. Like God's up in heaven going, I know I created the earth in six days, seventh day, I rested. Right? I was like, whoo, that's good. Let me relax. I know I told you to rest in the Bible. I said, hey, give you some commandments. One of them, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, right? But I get it. You live in America. You guys are super 
busy. I appreciate how busy you are. I have a hard time keeping the world rotating, and I need you for it. <laughs> think about Think about us. We're busy. Who works only 40 hours a week? <laughs> Losers. <laughs> Who goes home? Where, what? We go home and you just stay there for the night? You have a table and you eat at it? You cook at your house? You don't yell at your kids because you're relaxed? You like being there? Who does that? <laughs> Not me, right? And I remember, I remember, I remember, I remember. Um, 15 years ago, I preached on this. I'm a new, new dad. I'm not going to be busy. 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 I got busy. I'm busy for a season. It's only a couple years. Now I'm busy the teenage years. Now they got a social life. They got a social life. And I'm busy. And I'm busy. They're going to drive. And I'm not going to be busy anymore. And, I'm not, and, and it, I just keep being busy. I just keep going. It's, it almost becomes like this is just the way that it has to be. And the problem is as I'm busy, it's just passing me by. And I'm not getting more of it. In fact, what sucks is I stand up here awkwardly. <laughs> I'm just stealing time from you right now. <laughs> Never getting it back. It's just, it's just priceless. And it's precious. And I think myself included need to do a better job of understanding that Satan, the Bible says in John 10, comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. The trouble with time is we always think we have more time. We always think we have more. 2024 is not my year. I always have more time. In fact, I told you over and over again, uh, the writers of Scripture talk about this, and so I read a couple books from Psalms, and so thousands of years later, Jesus' half-brother, right, James, which is one of the reasons I believe that uh, Jesus was really the Son of God, is because his own brother would go on to become a pastor and tell people about him and then be martyred for his faith. And so um, that's how I, one of the reasons I think, man, he must have been actually the Savior of the world because his own brother believes in him, and you know how brothers are, right? And so, right? And so they're not usually your greatest supporters. And so, so James is now a pastor, and he, he kind of writes a similar thing. Okay, Psalms, the, the book of wisdom, Ecclesiastes, if you ever want to read that book, I'm going through that book, talks about time. It's better to go in the house of mourning than it is to go in the house of new birth, right? Because this is the end of us all. But watch what he says in James chapter 4, probably the most practical book in the Bible. He says, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow will go to this city or that city. So let me just stop there. How many of you, 2024, 20, you're, like, you're like, okay. I'm going to get through winter, and I have huge plans for my summer. I'm going to go here. I'm going to plan this out. I'm going to buy plane tickets. We're going to save money. We're going we're gonna to be really busy in the winter. We're not even going to talk to each other. We'll see you in August. We all do this, right? Planning trips out. I got to get my time, my, my time, my time, my weekend there. I got to get to Ocean City, Jersey, Ocean City, Maryland, Myrtle Beach. Got to get on the calendar. Okay, got to do this. Okay, he says... Listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we'll go to this or that city. Spend a year there. That would be sweet, right? Carry on business and make money. Why, well, you don't even know what tomorrow, what, what, hap what happened tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is a sin for them. You're not getting more time. You're not freezing it. You, you, the only person who can change the way you look at time is you. Time is priceless and it's precious. Let me just give you a couple more thoughts. Number, number two is this. Is, uh, here, here's, here's really important to remember. Because of that, because of the nature of time, you can't save it, you got to spend it. Now, imagine with me, I like this illustration, I'm going to come back to this. If I open this up and I try to put this sand in my hand, 
Would I be able to hold on to all of it? What would happen if I did that? It would just slip through. I might get a couple. And that, that, I think I like this representation of it because it's, it's sand. There's, there's individual um, sand elements in this, right? It's not just, it's not just one thing. It's, not, it's separated, right? If we could count all these out, they, could, they would all represent one, right? And if I tried to grab a hold of this and save it, I would, just, I would just lose it. And so the truth is when it comes to time, you have to spend it, which is really hard for some of you type A, responsible, saving for retirement, Dave Ramsey people. You know what I'm talking about? I'm saving up. I'm saving for the future, planning for the future, planning for the future, planning for the future, saving up for the future, got a retirement plan for the future. I'm saving for the future. Okay, what are you doing with the present? What if you don't get a future? What if all you have is the next week? What if this is the last time I'm ever on this stage? What if I say, are you ready to die? And this week I die. I warned you. <laughs> Could you imagine hey, what happened to the pastor? He died. What if this is the last Sunday that I ever get to speak? And I need to tell you, I need to remind myself, listen, I don't get to save time. I have to spend it. I, I, I think we struggle with this. Here's what I would call this. I would call this the Mennonite mentality. You know what I'm talking about? Now, if you're Mennonite in this place, I absolutely love you. I adore you. No disrespect to you, right? The Mennonites are the only reason we even have a church over in Limerick. So this is not a dig on, on the Mennonites. But when I got the building given to me as a 27-year-old man in the, at the church, the church was a shell of its former self. And there was a lack of investment put into things in the church. And so there was things in there that had not been updated since 1964. And sometimes when we would talk about it, I would talk to the Mennonites. They would say, it's still good. It's still good. It's got a... You know, hit it. It'll start again. It's still good. And what was interesting is that's, that's the Mennonite way. We save. We, uh, we reuse. We fix, right? Uh, we don't throw anything away. It was very evident. We were cleaning out the building. It was the Mennonite mentality, which is okay, okay, until uh, a few years into being the pastor at that church, I had to go down the street and visit somebody at a Mennonite retirement home. I walked into this Mennonite retirement home, and I expected the same old, same old. I expected low-grade low carpet. I expected cinder block walls with hand painting on it. I expected, I expected low-levels technology. And what I walked into was Taj Mahal. <laughs> they had a pool. They had a cafeteria. They had food that was still in date. They had... It was, like, beautiful, right? And I, 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 got, I didn't get it. I'm like, hold on a second. Your mentality is we're going to save all the money we could possibly save and put all the time into saving so that the best part of our years are the years where 95% of the day we're sleeping? <laughs> am, I, am I preaching right or wrong? There's nothing wrong with planning for the future, but are you taking advantage of the present you have? Are, are you living with the right now mentality? Do you understand how significant of a gift that you have now, you have to spend it, you can't save it. I know this is true from scripture. Jesus tells a parable. If you don't know how G about Jesus, Jesus um, came for normal people, so he spoke in a normal way. He did not come to reach the religious elite. In fact, he had a problem with the religious elite because the religion was stupid. So he tried to tell them, all the rules you're making up, you don't even follow them yourselves, right? You look good on the outside, but on the inside, you're toxic. So let's just deal with the inside. So he reached normal people. So if you're a normal person, you would have enjoyed Jesus. And he talked in a very normal way. The goal of a sermon is not to build up your religious eliteness. The goal of a sermon is to tell you what to do and for you to go do it. Okay? And so Jesus was very clear. He looked at people one time. He said, I'm going to teach you a parable of the talents. A parable of the talents. There was an owner of a business. Just, just summarizing it. And he said he left for a time and he entrusted his employees with some talents. To one he gave five, to one he gave two, and to another he gave one. The one who had five, when the owner of the business was away, went out and doubled it. The one who had two, doubled it. And the one who had one, went and buried it. Yeah, we had one. You ever been there? 
I would do more if I had more, right? If I was so blessed like this person, the point is, what are you doing with right now? Because the Bible says to whom much, uh, or if you're trusted with a little, you can be trusted with more. So the owner comes back and he says, hey, how much did you do? What did you do with the five? I doubled it. Gives him a high five. It's not what Jesus says, but that's what happens. High five. The guy who had two, he goes to four, gives him a high five. Dude who has one says, I still got one. I didn't lose it. Takes the one and gives it to the one with ten. Says, you were foolish. The point was to spend it. The, the point was to use it. The point was not to go bury it. Some of you are burying your time. You're waiting on tomorrow. You're waiting on the future. You're waiting on when instead of living right now. In fact, years ago when I was a young man, a, a pastor that I, still, that I still listen to from time to time, that still has fill, fill, fills me with wisdom and, and guidance and direction. As a young man, preached a message like this that I listened to, and I got to be honest with you, it was good. I preached. I like, well, I'm going to steal some of that, but I didn't really care because I was young. And now that I'm old and my life is passing me by and stuff is going really fast and five years are passing and decades are passing, this one thing he said years ago was so important. He said, listen, in your life, you need to develop a loser mentality. you got to spend your time. So don't lose the opportunity to turn your whens into now. You ever do that? Oh, hey, well, this is just a busy season. When it slows down, I'll slow down. Bro, a season is a few weeks or a few months, not a few years. It's not a season. It's a bad spiritual habit that is stealing from you your life. You, you got to turn your whens in, into now. Some of you are like, oh, when my, kids, when my kids get a little older, I'll spend more time with them. When my kids get older, I'll spend more time with my spouse. I don't even talk to my spouse. I'll talk to them when they get out of the house. Then your kids leave the house. You look at a stranger. You don't even like each other. I get it because week goes in our house. It's like, dude, wh where did the week go? Between sports and the YMCA and this and that and going here and running here. Hey, how you doing? It's good to see you. What's your name? You're pretty. You, you, can't, you can't save it. You, you have to spend what you're given. And here's the thing. One day, one day, you're going to say one of two things. All of us, myself included. You're going to say, um, I'm glad I did or I wish I had. I'm glad, I'm glad I spent time there. I'm glad I stopped. I'm glad I slowed down. I'm glad I... Or I, I wish I would have. I wish I wouldn't have allowed the flow and the habits and the normal of society to cause me to waste the life that God has given me. You, you can't save it. you got to spend it. Here's the question then. Let me, just, let me just. The question is, are you wasting the life you've been given or are you investing it? Are you wasting it or are you investing it? I, I want to end with, with this, with, with this parable. It's another parable that I, that I thoroughly uh, like. And so um, it's one of my favorite ones, especially for Americans. Because, like, our way of life is just ridiculous. Am I right or wrong? We work hard to get old to die. That's what we work hard to get old to die. Like, even, uh, even in, in, in the American church, one of the greatest phenomenons in the American church right now, one of the greatest forms of atheism, right? You want to talk about atheism? Atheism is claiming you, you know, there's no God or um, claiming that you, there is a God but living like he doesn't exist. That's called practical atheism, right? And so, yeah, there's a God, but my life doesn't line up with it at all. And so what's interesting to me is in the American culture, I've, I'm now grown up in church and now I'm 44 years old and I've watched parents raise their kids in church and then get older is you get to a certain age where you're like my time is finished and you begin to focus on something else so you have older people that raise their kids in church and get to a certain age and are like okay I don't really go to church anymore that's that you want to talk about transferring eighth practical atheism onto your onto to the next generation you're like well, that doesn't make sense I'm just not going to follow God in the best years of my life, right? Because you, you did all that and got to this point, and you're closer to heaven or hell than you've ever been, and now you're going to stop focusing on him? I think you should be focusing even more. Anybody else? You're closer to meeting him. I want to hear well done, good and faithful servant. Not pull off the spiritual gas and coast in, right? Where's the cruise control on this thing? And so it's just a strange phenomenon, right? And so I, I love this parable because this parable is about an older gentleman. And... Uh, 
The Bible says Jesus tells this story about um, this guy who he hits it rich in his business. Like he works super hard and he has this amazing season where, where God enlarges his territory. He has all this extra crop, right? All this extra success. And the Bible says he looks at it and thinks to himself, what should I do with this stuff? You ever been there? What should I do? Now that I got all this opportunity, all these resources, what should I do? So here's what he does. He builds bigger barns. He builds a bigger house. He buys nicer camels, right? He does all that stuff. And uh, the Bible says that he decides to take it easy and relax. That's the goal of life, right? Like, let's just get to the point where you just coast into heaven, right? And uh, the Bible says he sets his little, I just picture it, his lawn chair, right? One of those old school ones, pulls it out, sticks it down, gets a little umbrella, sticks it in the ground, got a little, 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 little a juice or whatever, sticks a little pot, a little, little umbrella in that, puts on his Hawaiian shirt, gets on his Ray-Bans, right? Uh, uh, and pulls up his white tube socks as high as they go, and he sits on the, sits on the chair and he just relaxes. And the Bible says that night his life is, is, is taken, like his time's up. He gets to heaven and the Bible says that the Lord looks at him and says, you're a fool. You're a fool. What you, what you should have invested, what you should have taken and put into life, what you, when you should have been thinking about time and this opportunity you have, instead you wasted your, op- your opportunity. And the truth is, if I think about my life, I think, man, how much of this do I waste? How much of this do I just let slip by? How many days do I just miss opportunities? How, how, how am I doing with this? I'll give you, I'll give you the, the truth. Not all the time that well. It just passes you by. and you, just, you begin just to run a race to nowhere. Doesn't it feel like that sometimes? without direction, without understanding, without ever thinking about eternity, without thinking about the next 20 years, without thinking about even the present. You just kind of run your life and you never even evaluate, am I wasting it or am I investing it? I am, I'm even thinking about what matters most in this moment. Years ago, I heard this story about this man. Um, now it's really practical, but at the time it was, I was my kids were little. And so, um, but this man had an older daughter she was 16 years old and so it's pretty connected now to I have a 16 year old son and the man all of a sudden realized oh my gosh everything is moving too fast and my daughter only has a few years that she's going to be gone so he got out his calculator and he went on his calendar and he realized my daughter has 146 Saturdays until she graduates um, and leaves the house so he filled up a jar with 146 marbles and every Saturday for the next 146 Saturdays, he would pick a marble up and take it out of the jar. And every time he picked a marble up, he would remind himself, this is, this is one of the last Saturdays that your daughter will ever be in your house as your kid uh, that's not responsible for herself. And he would place it. And I, I love that visual. Um, I wish I could do something like that and think like that and be more in that mindset. Like, can you, you, only, you only have a little bit of time. What are you doing? Where, where, where are you investing it? Are, are you embracing the what matters most? Sometimes in order to embrace the what matters most, instead of writing down a to-do list, you need to write down a to-don't list. You, you can't do everything. You can't. You can't be successful everywhere. Something will have to suffer. Sometimes you're in a season where you got to let something go so that you can actually focus on things that are important. You got to pursue something uh, wholeheartedly and let go of something even that you enjoy. Maybe a hobby. You go, I don't have time to do that. I got to embrace the what matters most moments. And in the middle of living, let me just, can I just give you one more thing? And we'll probably talk about this. In the middle of living, as you're running the race, you got to learn how to stop and rest sometimes. You know what I'm talking about? So we all have our nice clothes on right now, right? Next Sunday, I concur. I sign. I declare. Sweatpants Sunday. <laughs> Could you imagine? I'm not going to do that. But it, you don't even want, I haven't washed my sweatpants for six years. And so they're stiff. Like, right? Like, it's just, 
But it's okay. It's okay to rest. It's okay to stop. It's okay to relax. The Bible says that the Sabbath was given for man, not the other way around. It's okay. We're going to learn how to take advantage of the time that God has given us. And so here's the thing about it. As we preach through this series, um, nobody is going to make you change the way you handle time, or nobody is going to stand over you. The only person who can do it is you. So everybody have a car in here? Everybody have a car? You got here in a car today, right? No horse and buggies here today. And so you got a car, right? So in your car, how many of you have ever hit something, right? Not bad enough to damage it, but you hit it bad enough to put it out of alignment. Anybody? Right? Or maybe you got a little scratch on it, and then your spouse was like, hey, where'd that come from? Like, I don't know, right? <laughs> you hit the, so this is a safe spot. We're all going to, it's all happening. Like, you hit something? Okay. And it gets out of a line. When your car gets out of a line, what happens? You start to look like an awful driver. You, you're like, you have to two hand. You can't just put one hand up there. You gotta, and you're, you're constantly pulling the car back, back in a line. If not, the alignment just takes it off course. And so I'm just telling you, the way we live life is just going to take you off spiritual course. It's going to be out of a line with the word of God. So the only way you could do it is to, you got to bring it back. And the, the truth is, the real way to fix an alignment, if you really want to fix the alignment, what do you got to do? You got to take it to the mechanic. Nobody likes to go to the mechanic right? Take it to the mechanic, let them realign it, let them get it set, let them rebalance the wheels, let, you know, all that stuff. And so I'm trying to bring you into the spiritual mechanic so he can get your life straight. He, he, he can help you get your, your path straight. We're going to talk about some really practical stuff this next month. Like if, if time is so precious, don't you think it's okay that you don't have to hang out with people you don't like? You can say that in church. If you only get one life, you think God wants you to hang out with people you're not aligned with? I'm not talking about not being kind. Oh, I don't got to be kind. No, no, that's not what I said. But you don't have to. It's okay to not do things you don't like to do sometimes. Some of you, everything. I, mean, I, I want to rest. No, this person asked me to do something. They really need me right now. I can't say no. Meanwhile, you're about to burn out. It's okay for you to say, I'm staying in my PJs all day long today. Yeah, but I really need you. Yeah, but if I help you, I'm going to die. And I only get one life to live. It's just okay. I want to rearrange and reevaluate and realign my time. And the truth is, if I don't do it for myself, nobody else is going to do it. Everybody else in this world will clap you to the grave. You're tired? Great. You're exhausted? Great. Your family's falling apart? Great. Your kids are exhausted? You hate each other? Great. Keep going. You're doing great. Only you have the power to step back and go, this is crazy. What am I doing? Maybe there's something I should sell so I don't got to work 100 hours a week to buy, pay for something that isn't going to matter in 50 years. Maybe we should reevaluate. Maybe we should downsize. I know it's not good right now. The economy's awful. I can't downsize. I'm locked in, right? But maybe you got to do something like that. I'm not sure. Maybe you got to quit a sport. Maybe you got to stop doing a hobby. Maybe you got to go to Kohl's and get some new sweatpants. I don't know what you need to do. But I'm going to take, I'm, I'm, I'm going to realign. Listen, time is precious and priceless. You got, you got to spend it. You don't get to save it. Can you waste it? Yes. Can you invest it? Yeah, you can. So God, would you, would you be clear in this moment? God, would you begin to challenge us? Holy Spirit, you have the permission to do something in my life, to speak clearly to me, and then give me the courage to make the necessary changes that I need to make so that I can live in a healthy way towards you and hear well done, good and faithful servant. Would you stand to your feet all over this house? In Montgomeryville, would you stand and would you bow your heads and close your eyes? And as your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, I just want to read you one more verse. I told you it's all through scripture, so I just want to show you again because this, this, this tells me this is something we should pay attention to. Like it just tells me. It's not just one writer um, the Psalms, many of them written by David. Uh, the passage that I wrote a, a, a little bit ago in James, written by Jesus, half-brother. This one's written by a guy named Paul. Same thing, though. He says, be very careful, Ephesians chapter 5, how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Make the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Are you ready to die? I want to be morbid, and I'm not a prophet, but you have a 100% chance of dying. 
you are going to die. Are you living a life where you're making the most of every opportunity? One of my uh, favorite parts of my job, weirdly, has become memorial services. And, And the reason is because I'm a preacher of the gospel. And the gospel is always easier to preach when the concept and the reality of death is in the room. Death never sits well with us. The Bible says because we were never meant to die. That physical death is as a result of sin. And the Bible says when we die, um, that we have a soul. We're not just a body. You know this if you've ever seen a body. Is that that body is not the person. That person's gone. Because we're made up not only of a physical body, that's temporary, but we are born with an eternal soul. And that soul, um, because of sin, and because of our past, the Bible says that that soul um, will be separated from God forever, and that our destiny is a place called hell. That, that, that is the destination for man without the gospel of Jesus Christ. We play, we'll say, hey, there's good people, there's bad people. We even do it at a memorial service. You ever been to a memorial service where anybody says anything bad? It just doesn't happen. We focus on the good. It's as if they're on trial and we're trying to prove to the creator of the universe they were good people. But the reality is all of us know we fall short of perfection. So we'll try to say, well, they were a good person, so they must be in a better place. They must have got their angels' wings. They must, and all this stuff that just doesn't make sense. And the Bible says, listen, without the gospel, when you, when you die, you die in your sin. You'll be separated from God forever. And so a couple thousand years ago, um, God said, I'm not going to let that happen. Even though my creation... Um, rebels and runs and says no to me and uh, turns their back for me, I'm still going to send my best to them. And so God sent his one and only son. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting lasting life. What did Jesus do? Jesus came and he died on a cross for our sins. He laid his life down for us. And the Bible says it's through him that we can have a relationship with God that that our soul doesn't have to be separated from God forever but we can live with the promise of eternity the promise of a place called heaven the Bible describes heaven as a place with no more disease no more sickness no more no, no more pain no more tears it's a place of perfect love it's a place that's been uh, um, made and created for us That God invites us into this place, a heavenly place. So I love it because when you preach that message, there's there's a captive audience there. and You can say, hey, listen, um, here's the reality. This person knew Jesus. That's my favorite funerals. And they're with Jesus right now. And if there's anything I could say to you that, that, that I think they would want me to say, they would say, hey, do everything you can to make sure when you take your last breath that you're here with me. I was ready to die. I didn't live a perfect life. I didn't maybe get to accomplish everything I wanted to accomplish. But, but I was ready to meet Jesus because I put my trust and my hope in the finished work of the cross. I died in grace. I died in forgiveness. And I died in mercy. And because of that, I live in perfection. I live in eternity. And I just happen to think that that's if, if, uh, if you were to, to say to me, hey, what's the best way for me to start 2024 and it, for it to be different? What would be the one thing you would tell me to do? What, what would be your direction to me? If you only got to talk to me one time in, in your life, Pastor, what would you tell me? Here's what I would say. Make sure, make sure that you have given your life to Jesus Christ. Make sure that you've called on him. Make sure that you've confessed with your mouth and you believed in your heart that Jesus is Lord. Everything else will work out if you start there. Even when stuff doesn't make sense, your faith and your hope in Jesus will get you through. Make sure you start there. 
2024. What should I do? You start right there. That's the first step in being prepared. I'm ready to die. I'm ready to take my next breath. I know I met Jesus Christ. This first Sunday of 2024, that was my day. The Bible says if you call on him, he'll answer. If you call on him, he'll answer. He's knocking at the door of your heart. Jesus Christ, I want you to be my Lord and my Savior. Front to back, side to side, young or old. Been in church before, never been here before. I don't know Jesus Christ, but I know that's my first step. 2024 is going to be different. But the reason it's going to be different is I'm going to be a different person because I put my faith in the one who can change me forever. I'm going to call on him. I want to lead you in a simple prayer. I don't know Jesus Christ, but I want to. Front to back, side to side. Jesus Christ, I want him to be my Lord and my Savior. In Montgomeryville, I don't know Jesus Christ, but I want to. All over this place. Come on, a little bit of courage. Nobody can make this decision for you, just you. I want Jesus Christ to forgive me, heal me, and make me whole. Today, I'm going to put my faith in him. If that's you, all over this place. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Would you just shoot your hand straight towards heaven and say, Jesus Christ, today, I'm going to put my trust in you. I see a hand. I see a hand. I see a hand. I see a hand. Yes, another hand. Yes, yes, another hand. I'm going to put my faith in Jesus Christ. Another hand up in the bleachers up there. If you're in Montgomeryville, I'm going to make Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of my life. All over this house, let's pray together. Church family, whether you've prayed this before or you've never prayed it before, let's say something like this. Say, Jesus Christ, today I put my entire life in your hands. From this day forward... I'm going to follow you. Because of you, Jesus, I'm healed, I'm whole, I'm loved, and I'm restored. I'm never turning back. You can have it all. And Lord, as we celebrate that, Lord, all over this place, Holy Spirit, would you create a movement? Lord, every time we start a new series, uh, we start a, an opportunity for a movement to happen in our lives, Lord. And so I pray right now that you would begin to birth something and do something in families and single people and older people. There's some, some, somebody who's lived a long life right now and thinks their best days are ahead of them. But, Lord, they still have, or, or we're behind them, they still have some work to do, Lord. Lord, you're going to clearly communicate to them. Lord, you're going to let them know that their best is yet to come. Lord, there's some families uh, that live in the, in the context and the culture that we're in, Lord. Lord, and there's so much pressure to conform. But Lord, the Bible teaches us not to conform to the patterns of this world. Lord, thank you in advance for the courage you're going to give to some families in this place, some people to make some changes, Lord, the direction you're going to bring. Lord, somebody in this place is going to learn for the very first time it's okay to relax. It's okay to rest. It's okay to be still and know that you are God. Lord, thank you in advance for all that you're going to do. We love you. We thank you for your word. Your word is a lamp unto our feet, and it's a light unto our path. Lord, thank you for how you're guiding and directing us. We love you. We thank you for all that you've done here today. In Jesus' name we pray. For the first time in 2024, let's say amen together. Let's clap together. Was today your first time joining us? Our church exists for those not yet here, which means we exist for you. We'd love for you to be a part of another online experience this Sunday. Or join us in person at our Phoenixville or Montgomeryville campuses. Visit our website at jrny.church or follow us on social media to stay up to date, learn what it's like to follow Jesus, and learn how to get involved. Have a great rest of your day and we'll see you soon.